These 21 teenagers from Bronx, New York, have grown up in the 1980s, when New York City high schools saw over 70% of their student population become African American and Latino. They have mainly known broken promises and their families' dreams deferred. They've grown up reduced by headlines, labeling them at risk, dropouts, failures, and having no liking of learning. Since 1986, we have followed these teenagers' education. When I look out the window, I see children cutting school, like cars racing by, not stopping for the lights. I don't like school, <laughs> so I'm really not doing too well. I don't know. I, I can't get into it. It's boring. The students in the school is ridiculous. I can't put up with that. And I spoke to the principal and I said, I really want to study why kids drop out. Can I do that here at your school? And he said, absolutely. You have free access. Just don't mention dropping out to the kids. And I said, well, that's very interesting. Why, why don't you want me to say it? And he said, because if you say it, they'll do it. And I thought to myself, we've heard that before. We've heard it about sex. And I also thought to myself, we should be so lucky that kids wait for adults to say dropping out or sex before they do it. It's been a while I haven't been in school. And kind of, you know, I got to catch up to my studies to myself. It's not that easy, but I can handle it. Never were kids, in my experience there, engaged in a conversation about the contradictions of race and class and gender that organize their lives. So that while in school they're told, stay in school, you'll get a job, and on the streets they're more likely told, what are you doing in school? You can make more money on the streets. There's no safe place inside schools to talk about that very contradiction, which plagues the minds and the lives of, of these youngsters. I, I was, I was very negative because I, I went into the office with this attitude. It's just like, she's not going to tell me anything I don't already know. She's not going to be able to help me. So why am I wasting my time? Since I was in grade school, they, everybody kept telling me I can do it. And I, no, I can do it. But I took it upon myself since I know I can do it. So I just mouth mess up. So it was my, mist my mistake. I'm trying to be pretty boy Floyd. More often than not, the dropout is poor, overaged, and underskilled. That those three characteristics make up the vast majority of those who will drop out. It is extraordinarily difficult for a 17-year-old to sit in a ninth-year ninth class with 14-year-olds. Now, we can say that ought not to be, that education is so important that education is its own reward to, to kind of twist Cicero. And we can argue that all day long, but young people have their own set of rules. And if you are out of age, if you are out of sync with those around you, you more often than not will move away. So we have faced the very serious problem with the overage student. Left back perhaps once in the elementary school, left back or missing for a period of time in the middle school, and perhaps again in the high school, is a person who is almost certainly going to drop out before he or she remains in school. I wish I was one year ahead of myself. Instead of cutting classes, because I wish I, I, wish I never did that, really. Because I, I was just doing it to be with the ink file, because I saw all my other friends doing it. I said, oh, yeah, let's go out. Yeah, cut class. Sure, let's go. Boom, it was outside. And when we talk about the dropout rate, I make the point that it's much higher among black and Latino students than among the general population. It's bad enough among uh, just the general population. And I suggest that uh, to some degree this is so because we have not cared about uh, this student body. And uh, whether that's uh, blatant racism, subtle racism, uh, whether it is uh, intentional or, or lack of concern, it matters little to these students who are being mistreated. I don't know all my teachers, that's, what, that's the point. 
I saw it in my face, but I don't know their names. But they don't, they don't really teach you, man. What they teach you? They don't teach you nothing. They teach you the same thing every year, over and over again, over and over again. I don't want to hear it. We have substantial numbers of children uh, who are on welfare, in uh, poverty, uh, don't have both a father and a mother, uh, have uh, a uh, mother, may themselves, uh, the mothers not even be married, and there's a breakdown in family structure. So, whereas before you could count on the mother and the father urging the kid to do better and worrying about their report card and worrying about how they presented themselves in school. I believe that the education system undoubtedly uh, could be improved upon, but until you get family responsibility uh, for what the child uh, does and punishment at home if you don't perform uh, to the standards uh, expected of you by the parents, that as much as we do, we can't do anything comparable to the reimposition of family responsibility. I also believe that the schools can, in part, substitute, not uh, anything close to uh, totality, by imposing uh, more restraints and more testing and more uh, requiring you to meet the mark or to uh, be left back, as we used to say. Social class is the best predictor of who drops out, but second to that, it's being held back in grade. I have evidence suggesting that being held back doubles the likelihood of your dropping out, halves the likelihood of your graduating, and that's even true and even more true for kids who are reading at or above grade level. So that while schools might see it as motivational to hold a kid back, in fact, that's a counterintuitive strategy. What it does is convince kids they're stupid, they're too tall, they're in the same class with their brother or sister, and they get out. So that we have a series of structures and policies that promote dropping out. I cannot deal with getting left back. I felt like I was being pampered. Like I had a, a, my mother on the side of me telling me to go to school. Or, well, you don't have to do this if you don't want because you're not capable of performing like the rest of it, like everyone else, you know. So I decided to leave. When you label people in a pejorative way, um, educationally disadvantaged, culturally deprived, at risk, potential dropouts, that those adjectives are not inspiring at all. When you label children in that way, you can't expect them to behave in that way. And you are setting up an expectation modality on the part of the educational system. We do not face the fact that we are not succeeding with many, many, many of our children, not just those who are dropping out, but we are not succeeding with our children who remain in school and are disaffected, disconnected, disillusioned, becoming robotic. I think that uh, people are just hoping and hoping and hoping that the tremendous scope of what it is that we have perpetrated on children will somehow go away or uh, we will begin to make some measures that are palliative and people won't look beneath the surface. If uh, we don't do a very effective job and if we fail to touch the uh, human condition at this time, that the future will not be secure for any person in the city regardless of their economic circumstance. And the notion that anybody can sit on the sideline regardless of whether it's the church, uh, city government, uh, private sector, private citizens who don't use the public schools. That simply is not a notion that uh, carries any validity in this part of the 20th century. Fear of flying, fear of snakes, dogs, cops, fear of not dressing in black, fear of not being smart enough. Is college just a dream? Should I measure success with money? Is acceptance a con job? My goals wear eyeglasses. Every time we talk, we have to copy from the board, our minds going out the window, and we sit there forever in a fog. But I do believe that even in a storm, we'll find some light.